From the very beginning, Atlas had known who Gravano was, and he felt uncomfortable being in his company. I knew that this guy, you know, obviously uh, put people under the ground. But what worried Atlas the most was what Sammy the Bull told him about his boss, John Gotti. It's the last time I saw him, he, he came in the gym and he said, he said, you know, Bo, he used to call people sometimes Bo. He said, uh, the word is the government's going to be coming down after me with an indictment. He said, they invade countries. He said, they're coming after me. He said, that can make you shake in your boots a little. And he said to me, they want me to betray my friend. And nobody can make you give up your dignity as a man except yourself. Obviously, he shouldn't have been talking to me about that, but it's like he was trying to get me to help him convince himself that, or convince me, really, that he wouldn't do this. In December 1990, the FBI arrested John Gotti, Sammy the Bull, and other Gambino crime family members. The electronic surveillance that had gone on for years had finally paid off. The FBI had recordings that revealed the innermost secrets of the Gambino family. And the person revealing them was none other than the boss himself, John Gotti. Even though they had hundreds of hours of incriminating surveillance tapes, the government still needed someone close to Gotti to testify against him. The last person the FBI expected to turn on Gotti was Gravano. I think Sammy turned because Sammy's a very smart guy, and he was sitting there watching what was going on, and it dawned on him that John Gotti was going to blame him for everything, and Gotti was going to walk. And Sammy decided that wasn't going to happen. Ironically, it was John Gotti's own words that turned Sammy the Bull into America's most famous government witness against the mob. Well, the way Sammy the Bull tells the story is that here he is. They have solid evidence. They have these tapes. The tapes are going to sink them. And what he had on John Gotti was his ticket out of jail. It was a, it was a get out of jail free card. And he knew it. At John Gotti's trial in 1992, Sammy the Bull's testimony sealed his boss's fate. It took a jury only 13 hours to return a guilty verdict against Gotti. He was given a life sentence without parole and was sent to the Federal Maximum Security Prison in Marion, Illinois. In April of 1993, Sammy the Bull Gravano made his first appearance on national television, testifying before a Senate subcommittee. My name is Salvatore Gravano. Early in my life, I was given the nickname Sammy the Bull. I became a made member of the Gambino family in 1976. As part of my cooperation, I told the government about my life of crimes including the fact that I participated in 19 murders. Gravano then published a best-selling book called Underboss about his killing spree. He went on television to promote it. Laura Garofalo's father, Eddie, was mentioned in the book. Well, I read it from beginning to end. When he does talk about my father in the book, he says, we had to kill him. And that was it. It was a very brief mention. But he does talk excessively about this farm he had taken from my father and how the happiest moments of his life was this farm. Laura Garofalo cannot forget that farm. It was gut-wrenching for me because this farm was our farm. And in Sammy's book he talks about this farm and I'd sit on the porch and I'd look down the rolling hills with grass and, and these are my memories. Despite Gravano's admission to 19 murders, the federal government locked him away for less than a year. As part of his deal with the government, Sammy the Bull was taken into the witness protection program after promising that he would never violate the law again. He was given a new identity and then resettled with his family in a secret location. Some described Gravano's deal as the deal of a lifetime. In 1996, Sammy the Bull Gravano arrived in Tempe, a suburb of Phoenix in Arizona. He was using a new name, Jimmy Moran. He had a lot of cash, more than enough to finance a construction company, a pool installation business, and an Italian restaurant. But his new identity did not fool one of his neighbors. Car pull up it was a realtor's car. Three people got out, a realtor, a woman, and a couple. I looked, I immediately recognized 
sang me the bull. I introduced myself and the general contractor in the neighborhood. He laughed. He said, well, I'm a, I'm a contractor, too. About two weeks later, the, my doorbell rang. I went, and there he was. And he said, I bought the house. I'm going to remodel it. You said you were a contractor. Let me hire you on a day-by-day -day basis and see what happens. I started the work. We started the demolition. The prior owner had left the house uninhabitable. It literally needed to be totally gutted. As we were going over the drawings, I said, well, aren't we going to put any gun turrets on the corner? And he just kind of looked, taken it back a little bit, and he laughed. And he, what do you mean? I go, well, what do you mean, what do I mean? He said, well, do, do you think you know who I am? I said, Jimmy, from the first day I saw you, I knew exactly who you were. Gravano was building a mansion for his ex-wife, Deborah, and his family. He wanted his children to be near him and he ensured that this happened by supplying Deborah with luxury. He spent almost a year and a half and half a million dollars making her happy. Near the end of construction, when we were close, we were in the house one day. Debbie was standing on one side of a kitchen counter. His son Gerard was behind me and Sammy was off to my right. She said to me, Vince, I don't seem to have any water in this sink, hot water. And he responded with, well, how are you going to fix it? And the more I talked about what had to be done, the matter he got. You know, he got hot, he got profane, and I said, look, I've told you this before, I'm telling you again, you, you don't know about construction. At that, he charged me. And, you know, and when they call him Sammy the Bull, boy, you get that impression. What came next was classic Sammy the Bull. He stuck a gun in my head, point. And I looked at Debbie, and she had color drained from her. Her jaw was open. I could hear Gerard behind me going, Dad, Dad, Dad. And he said, you know, you're not going to make me go back. And I said, nobody makes anybody do anything. You know, we all, we're all agents of free will. And he left. Gravano walked away because he did not want to attract the attention of the police. He was in breach of his agreement with the federal government because he had started dealing drugs and members of his family were working for him. Meanwhile, in New York, customs officials were becoming alarmed by the growth of the ecstasy trade. Tremendous profit margin made overseas at pennies a pill. Import value uh, to time when smuggled in the United States about $7 a tab. And in the clubs in the large metropolitan areas around the country, a, a tablet of ecstasy will go from $25 to $35 a tablet. Drug dealers were moving ecstasy from New York to Phoenix. In Phoenix, local police, Sergeant Jim Cope and Detective Ron Sterrett, were in charge of an investigation into an ecstasy drug ring. Middle of upper class kids of every race. It was just amazing. It was a drug fest. And I, I think that we were one of the first agencies at the time in the nation that was doing something so aggressive undercover work with ecstasy. Cope and Sterrett were soon focusing their attention on the city's biggest ecstasy dealer. The bad guys on the street were telling my undercover guys the ecstasy was being controlled by the Italian mobsters from New York. We got contacted by a source of information who informed me that Michael Papa was very involved in the moving of the large amounts of ecstasy. And I knew he was an Italian from New York, so I, you know, I kind of thought we were going in, in, in the right direction. That made Mike Papa a prime target. He worked at Marathon Construction, a company run by Sammy the Bull. I was shocked. The kids that we were looking at had no, no other finances in their background, but they're driving Infinities, they're driving brand new Lexuses. I mean, they're going to clubs, they're treated like royalty. One criminal source had Mike Papa's telephone number. That proved to be a major breakthrough. We had subpoenaed the subscriber information on the phone that Mike Papa was using and learned at that time that that specific phone, which was serviced by Nextel, was subscribed to Marathon Construction and Debbie Gravano, and it had a list of employees that had the Nextels and the radio features. It appeared that Marathon Construction was a front for an ecstasy drug operation. 